good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be joining us from. Uh, my name is Devin Morgan. This is Driveline Academy podcast, and uh, welcome to monsoon season in the Pacific Northwest. Yeah. Uh, joined as per usual, a Driveline Academy coordinator, Jeremy Tactile. Good morning. Good morning. We're kind of in the afternoon shade or whatever. Yeah. Special guest. Uh, like just the the OG of OGs when it comes to like actual driveline hitting because you created it, my friend, uh, yeah. Jason Ochart. How are you, sir? I'm great, man. Happy to be here. Hell yeah. Big fan of the pod, so ha happy to be on and uh, appreciate the invite. So uh, I've told this story before on other places, but I'm going to tell it here because it's ours and you play a humongous role in it. Okay, let's hear it. So it's, uh, gosh, I don't know, like... January 18, and I had been subscribing to the Driveline uh, Sunday Th Thunder Nuggets blog, mm -hmm. OC, thank yep. you, uh, for, for a couple years, um, and I had already read uh, Coaching Hitting uh, Parts 1 and 2, Yeah, which like, you know, those got published, what, in 16 or 17 or something? Yeah, I think the first one was late 2016, because I yeah. got hired in September, and I think that was my first blog. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and like just yeah. full send first blog out of yeah, the gate. Dude. It's just like, hey, uh, surprise! Most everything you think about hitting is wrong. Uh, I mean, I remember, I remember where I was uh, when I was I was working at a different job. I obviously didn't work at Driveline and reading that blog and like, and going into this idea that like the cueing that we're all comfortable with and we all grew up with yeah. is literally like inhibiting your ability to maximize motor output. And there's also like this trailing thing of like influencing negative influencing your perception and yeah. it was just like man i i was just like oh like everything's changed yeah you know everything's changed so uh i i had been reading that stuff and sunday thunder nuggets had something about uh youth development six-week program and driveline yeah and i'm like all right i live somewhere between like 45 minutes to an hour and a half away how on earth am i gonna get my kid <laughs> how am i gonna get my kid down here yeah. right and we had um you know we had gone to different places for lessons and camps and all this other stuff. And, uh, you know, I, I think I was in the same boat and I probably still am. It's like a lot of parents is just like, you have a kid that likes baseball yeah, and they seem like they're kind of good. And you're trying to wrap your head around, like, am I seeing this just through rose colored glasses or is my kid actually good? And, and no matter kind of what the answer to that question is like, how do I help? Because just inherently I don't have enough to offer. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, God bless my wife. She allowed me to talk to uh, Danny's teacher and pull him out of school a half hour early uh, so that we could get hit down here and be practice. And then, um, you know, I walked in the door day one um, and two things happened. Literally, as I walked from Terry's old PT area onto the main training floor, Herbie Good was in the cage. Because Herbie, I think at the time, was like yeah. maybe thinking about hitting. Yeah, I think he hit that year at, a, at his junior college and yeah. It, so, it was fun to watch. So I take one step over the threshold. Herbie hits a ball 111. And like, you know, I was uh, I was 40, 41 at that point. So I am multiple decades past having seen any type of competitive baseball. And the first thing that I see on the first day that I go into driveline is a guy who's a pitcher. Yeah. Who's thinking about hitting yeah. hitting a ball 111 miles an a hour? A behemoth, oh, uh, the dude. largest yeah. person I think I've <laughs> ever met in person. Yeah, yeah. and I was just like, okay, uh, like my eyes are really, really peeled wide open at this yeah. point. But then uh, the other thing that just kind of stood out was uh, the training was so different, but so highly intentional than I think anything I'd ever seen in the U space. Because the U space, at least the experiences we had, is very non-intentional you know yeah. like most of the time people are just trying to get some money out of you right and we're gonna we talked about this on the last podcast that's dropping today actually about like the lesson model yeah. right when the lesson model happens in youth baseball and there's no quantitative information about like where you are and where you want to go or the progress you've made it typically the conversation just is like it's about the game result yeah and the problem is that like the signal lacks a ton of fidelity because it's youth yeah right uh, there is a youth pitcher on the other side of that equation. There's youth field on the, fielders on the other mm -hmm. side of the equation. And like, yet we look at game changer stats. We're like, oh, my kid's batting, you know, 850. And we feel like yeah. a, a sense of pride in there. And it's only because you don't understand whether that's real. Yeah. And the environment for those youth, those first youth sessions was so intentional. And then there was just like the, the layer of data on top of it. I was just like, man, this is, this is unreal. Yeah. So that was like a six week session. 
Uh, and my behavior in the six week sessions is like literally, I think what I often counsel parents not to do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I was like, I was always right next to the cage. Yeah. I was always right next to the cage. I was always like getting video. Now I will defend myself slightly. Uh, I always tried to be like outside of, of Danny's line of sight. Cause that's, that's the thing that like, I think a lot of hitters, youth hitters, it's like, if you're a, a right-handed hitter and your parent is on like the other side of the cage and you're just like staring at them all the time. Yeah. Kids get yipped up super easily. Totally. With that. Yeah. Totally. Uh, thankfully my, my son was a right-handed hitter so I could be on that side of the cage and he wouldn't see me. So I would just kind of get some video or whatever. Yeah. And I also didn't talk to him. Like I didn't, I didn't try to, I didn't say a single cue Get your head in there. Yeah, would have kicked you out probably. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. good thing you didn't. I'm sure you wouldn't be here. Didn't kick yeah. me out. No, uh, you were great. You were great. Um, and, but like you know, you and I got a chance to like talk about stuff, and I think we had talked a little bit over Twitter. Uh, I had put out this video for my little league that was like principles oh, yeah. of youth hitting. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. And ugh, you know, it's like I, I actually went back and watched it a couple minutes ago, and it's like, okay, this is probably it's fine, but it's also like slightly Great, embarrassing yeah. because there's so much of the equation that I'm now aware of that yeah. at that time, you know, we just weren't, we weren't really, we weren't really there. Yeah. Anyways, end of that, end of that six week session. I don't know if you remember this, but I said to you, uh, not knowing how, how not simple this was that if driveline opened up a facility closer to where I live, that I would work for driveline for free for two years. Yeah. And, and I think you were like, what is, yeah, you should, don't do that. Yeah, yeah don't, don't do that. <laughs> yeah. uh, anyways, flash forward. Uh, we go into that season. Uh, Danny is just having like he's having a blast playing baseball because yeah. he spent the six weeks like not only I think getting better, but also having a clear idea of like of what getting good really is. Yeah. Because in those sessions, I mean, you want to talk about the guys that are in those hitting groups. Uh, Dan Comstock, mm -hmm. uh, Kozak was there. Uh, I remember seeing Dudo in every once in a while. Yeah. Uh, like, they're just a bunch of guys. And, like, when you walk in the gym and you see Dan, who is a, a, a horse, and he's, like, warming up at bench at 315. Yeah. And you're eight, about to turn nine. Pretty direct line between, like, what that guy does in the cage and yeah. strength capacity and athletic output outside of the cage. Totally. Um, so, uh, so Danny was having a lot of fun. And there was a talk that like some of the trainers are going to come up and watch one of our, one of his little league games. And then that kind of fizzled because the guy that was kind of organizing that, uh, who was in CR, uh, left, he left the company. And I think you hit me up and you were like, yeah, uh, you know, not going to be able to make it. There's stuff going on. And, and to a degree, like how preposterous is it to like have guys at driveline coming to watch like nine year old baseball? Yeah. Like that, that's that's preposterous. Like, bless your guys' hearts yeah. for even for even offering yeah. that. Well, Got to see the results in the field, man. That's right. Matters, right. So then, uh, you, well, of course, you know, with a nine yes. U, with nine U baseball. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, so then, uh, I remember I said to you, I was like, totally, like, not a big deal at all. And I was like, you know, uh, I just so happened to be on the driveline careers page last night, and I was looking at that business associate mm -hmm. role. And you said to me. Pulling up the receipts. There <laughs> yeah. we go. You said to me, it was like, hey, sounds great. I hope you don't mind. I just sent all your contact information to the CEO of the company. <laughs> and I was like, why not? Like, what, what's happening here? Yeah. So, uh, man, it, I, I think if you hadn't opened that door for me, we just, I, I, I certainly wouldn't be here. And I know I've said this to you uh, privately before, and I will say it publicly because I very believe in giving people their, their proverbial flowers, man. I just like, uh, the fact that we have this thing is, is very much a credit to you not kicking me out of the gym for being like a super salad yeah. on top of it parent, you know? Yeah. So man, I just, that means a lot to me. You bet, man. No, I remember those days very well. And, um, to me, it just stood out how passionate you were about youth baseball, about your son, about just making it a good experience. First and foremost, doing it better, doing it in a smarter way. And, um, just really caring about, the kids on your team, the kids in your community, and just youth baseball at large. So it was really obvious from the second that we met and, and you know, you're talking about asking questions and, and filming and always like in, in a really respectful way, like, hey, what's this drill doing? Or well, who's that player? What's he working on? Or what are these leaderboards? Like just really, yeah. really great questions, really intelligent questions. Um, 
about the system and kind of like the the why behind all of it yeah um it was obvious to me that you were the right guy for for the job when whenever that came up and i was hoping that uh it'd work out and, and I'm, I'm certainly glad it did because i mean seeing heck what it yeah. is now is is pretty awesome man. heck yeah so like so let's talk about like the system thing because um you know you basically started from zero at yeah. driveline but so correct me if i'm wrong a lot of the the foundational elements of the system that is i think kind of become driveline hitting all started at menlo yeah um and the so two stories that i like menlo stories i want to make sure i understand yeah. this correctly word on the street is that at some point at menlo you invented a study that like said that like such some bat was like the hottest bat <laughs> oh in the my world God, yeah who told you that <laughs> that's secret knowledge it's got yeah. some inside information yeah. um that, that's a silly story um what happened was I was reading this book. It's a great book. It's called Top Dog, The Science of Winning and Losing. I have it at my house. Yeah. I recommend it to coaches a lot. Yeah. And um, there's a lot that it covers, but basically one of the premises that really like um, struck a chord was using competition in practice and in training. Right? Yeah. Um, we're a really competitive species, especially athletes. And you can use that to, to kind of make people really want to train harder, basically. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of like ways to hack training, um, to, to kind of like improve the skill development process. Right. And there's a lot of examples in the book about like studies and also like anecdotes. And, and, uh, one of the ones was the illusion of having an advantage can help athletes power through risk aversion, which is like a huge sure. um, inhibitor of performance. Right. And the study was about putting and it was like bunch of uh participants doing like a, like 10 10 foot putts I, i'm not getting this right it's something along the lines right yeah um and in the control group they just hit their 10 putts and then in the uh the other group they basically the only difference was they told them this ball has been lucky today and that group made like a significantly more putts that's hilarious simply by them thinking like all right i have like this slight advantage right um so I thought about that. And there's other examples in the book about about that. And uh, and in hitting, it's like you're always so um, insecure, right? It's it's so much failure that that I think risk aversion is a huge problem in hitting, um, where guys don't know how to diagnose um, their errors. Basically, like they just get beat down by the game, and and it kills their confidence, and they get out of that like attack mode. Like hitting is very aggressive. You should be on the attack. You should be offensive and and really like out trying to do damage right even more so if you're trying to train in a way that's kind of commensurate with the demand of competition yeah like because you you have to find context for it's not just game failure it to a degree it's like it's failure in training yeah mm -hmm. and if and and so it's so different than what we kind of came up with yeah. right which is just like super soft bp and we hit on the t practice doesn't look like competition at all yeah but it's safe yeah, it's super safe because you're not going to be challenged that way. Exactly, exactly. Um, so anyway, I, I'm thinking, how can I apply this to to Menlo? Which in Menlo was like a total like experimental <laughs> process, you know, a bunch of guinea pigs basically. Sure. But um, I went to a guy named Garrett who was like the gossip king of the team, and I and I told him like, hey man, I did this study, and this bat, the Z1000, is two miles an hour more exabilo than any other bat. He's like, really? I'm like yeah, dude, this thing is hot. This thing is crazy. It's got a huge advantage, and, like, it, and it was hot. I, I mean, know. it was it was kind of hot. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah who yeah. knows? Yeah, Maybe that's the point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so he's like, oh, really, really, and like, so he takes it. He starts using it, and and honestly, the reason I chose that bat is because we had like three or four sitting in the cage, <laughs> sure. si sitting in our like uh like where we had all these bats, like it's like a big trash can in the yeah, just in our storage area. And um, these bats are also selling for like forty dollars on Amazon, <laughs> and we for had no really? money, by the way. Um, so he starts using it, and he starts telling guys on the team that this bat is like, you know, a, a secret kind yeah. of like, you know, super hot um, bat, and he's hitting well. And next thing you know, like his friend Drake is using it, and he starts doing well. And like next thing you know, the entire team is using this bat, and um, it kind of became like synonymous with with Menlo, and. Yeah. Um, Next thing you know, the entire conference is using these bats. <laughs> and like at the same time, I'm posting these videos on YouTube and on Twitter of yeah. just like us hitting like home runs and, and all, all kinds of like, uh, like, I don't know, I'm just like putting these montages together yeah. and they're going viral and stuff like that. And people are commenting, what is this bat? You know, and the bat also sounded like really weird. Yeah. Um, so next thing you know, these bats are selling for like seven hundred dollars on Amazon. Still people are, are like going everywhere. Still I are. still see them every once in a while. I'll be like watching a game and be like, 
that's a Z1000. Yeah. Uh, they're still out there. Um, and I remember like with Jake McKinley, the, the head coach there, we, at one point we were just like scouring the earth, looking for these Z1000s, calling these, um, random, like, like baseball stores and, and, oh, and, and, and warehouses. And, 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 and like, a lot of times we'd call them and be like, you're like the eighth person to call about this bat. Like what's going on with these bats? Yeah. Um, that's hilarious. Yeah, yeah, super funny, man. I didn't tell anyone on the team until like years after. I was gonna say that's like, my like, favorite part of the story years, is yeah. that they never at any point did they realize that this was all yeah. just made up. Well, I think Dan was telling me he's like, man, man, those those bats were so good, you know, they're so hot, this and that. I'm like, actually, they weren't. He's like, what? I'm like, yeah, they were exactly the same as like any other bat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is the tr- which is the funny thing about like just like the bat performance standards where you're talking about Beezers or BB cores or uh, or even like the USA the USA bats, the new youth bats, and the U triple SA bats. Yeah. They're all built, and they're supposed to uh, conform to a standard. Yeah. If I'm a bat manufacturer, I'm trying to conform to that standard for, like, the testing period, and then I want my bat to get hotter. So, yeah. like, everybody kind of plays around at the edges about, like, how we can squeak out a little bit more performance yeah. relative to the the performance standard that I'm supposed to be abiding by. Yeah. And the funny thing is, to, to me, is, like, uh, I think the first time I started going down the rabbit hole about, like, moment of inertia and kind of learning about that part of batting performance yeah it was like oh that that probably is just responsible for the overwhelming majority of like the hot bat stuff yeah right because because if you yes there's a period of time in like the 2017 2018 u triple sa bats there's some of those bats that are like there's a reason that they sell for like three grand on ebay because they are just like they were if they ever conform to the standard it was right at production yeah and they're composites the wrapper, yeah and then they and then they get they get crazy hot over time um but like if you if you understand that like that hasn't been in the ecosystem since about that point uh well how else are you going to improve batting performance you have to conform to a standard you have to shift moi yeah. like that just is what it is mm-hmm. which makes it near impossible it seems like to understand what's the right bat for the right person because to me it seems like that moi moment of inertia basically how easily it is to swing an yeah. object is always going to kind of be defined by the swinger mm-hmm. right like what what swing mechanics can i like implement but maybe also get away with relative to this bat yeah. like and it's just such a in and, and, and yet if you go to like justbats.com to this day you're going to see guys like same bat maybe the z1000 there's yeah. going to be one kid that's like this is the or one parent Right, because yeah. it's this is the best bat in the world, and then there's gonna be it five stars all the way around, and yeah. like the next review is somebody garbage. Send it back after two weeks, yeah, and it's totally. like, how can both of these things be true? Yeah, right. Like it's the same bat. Yeah, and that's a yeah. question we get a lot from academy parents: is like, what should I be doing for my kids' bat? Because like as they're growing, bats are not cheap. You grow out of bats, like then you hit the 13 14 age group and it's like okay now we know we have to start swinging a drop three do we get a 31 maybe they're going to grow and then like he grows out of it now he needs a 32 or a 33 um so like what would what would like your yeah um it's it's tough i mean i i don't have a lot of experience in that area like as far as like you know kid growing up and getting stronger and dealing with different sizes different drops and, and all that stuff um you know, I think what feels good is probably a good place to start. You know, what feels comfortable, like when they swing, is their barrel not dropping beneath yeah. kind of like the plane that their hands are on? It's probably a good place to, to start. Um, and eventually, I think like with, with us, I know we've done some bat fitting stuff where we, you can look at uh, various things like how hard are they hitting the ball and then how, cons- how consistently are they hitting the ball hard, yeah. right? Um and oftentimes we'll see that the more end loaded bats will have a higher like top end exit mm-hmm. below, but it'll come at the expense of some bat to ball skills. Um, so the more balanced, the lighter bats, you're obviously you're going to make more contact and it'll be a quicker swing, but you're not going to hit the balls hard. Right. Yeah. So I think when you're looking at a player, it's like, okay, what do you value? What's your player type? Do you swing and miss a lot? Maybe you need to, to make that adjustment or do you want to add more power? Um, you know, maybe try more end loaded bat, heavier bat, and then just, just trial and error you know ultimately i think there'll be a, a system where you can go into a a sporting goods store and, yeah. and actually do an assessment and wear a sensor or do something take some swings and they can give you a you know some data there but as of now it's like and it's the same in like the big leagues to be yeah. honest guys yeah, yeah, like yeah, rap yeah. master like yeah that's the one that's like come on what are we doing here and like in it to me it has to come back to bat speed yeah like that's just what it has to come back to it has to come back to 
some way to kind of discern uh, how well can you move this object in space, both yeah. in terms of speed and adjustability. Uh, which, Jason Ochart story number yeah. two that I want to run by you. If I remember correctly, you told a story, I think on a podcast, where it was when you were still playing. And if I remember correctly, it was probably a while ago. Uh, you you hit the ball, you're running up to first base and you're like thinking, oh, I'm going to like take a nice easy jog, see if I can, you know, I'm going to take the turn, see what two looks like. Yeah. And you're like three steps away from one and they're like, smell you later. And if I remember correctly, the the story that you're telling is just like uh, realizing how the quality of defense range and everything kind of impacted your ability to go from like a contact speed guy to yeah. like, well, now my tool is kind of defined by the fact that the the, the opposition, the defense is that much more competent. Yeah. I got to figure something else out. Am I remembering that correctly? Yeah, yeah totally. I mean, okay. I remember I hit like 470 in high school or something because like the only thing I could do well was like run fast. Um, so I just like hit ground balls and, and if it passed yeah. twice, I was just like safe. And it was like thick grass and shitty, yeah. uh, p- bad, bad fields. No, you're fine. My you're fine. Yeah. Um, then I got to college and I like hit a chopper in the five, six hole. And I'm thinking that's a knock for sure. And I was out by like, you know, 30 feet yeah. and, uh, immediately was just like a worse player. Um, you see that in professional baseball a lot too. Like we get these kids from, from high school drafts and, um, they're so used to just running like a 500 Babbitt, you know what I mean? That they sure. get there and they're sure. like, okay, these like shortstops are legit. The infielders are, are amazing. The outfielders are all good. And you just have to hit the ball harder and at better angles more consistently to, to succeed. Yeah. Which means that you need bat speed. Yeah. Like it's just, uh, I, I just don't think there's anything more important, but tell me if I'm wrong than cultivating bat speed. It's yeah. just like, it's the thing. Like yeah. there's no if, ands, or buts about it. No question. I mean, it's pretty pretty clear too when you look at the bat speeds by level. It's like it's pretty obvious that it's um, the biggest indicator of of success, present and future. Yeah. And um, it's not everything. Like obviously, you got to make contact, got to swing good pitches, and there's other parts of hitting. But especially when it comes to youth baseball, I think, and and developing skill at a young age, it's like optimizing for rotational speed and coordination um, is huge. Yeah, and I think we can fine tune some of the other things later. But if I was a, a parent and I had a kid, I'd be just trying to get him to or her to, to swing fast and develop that ability to move fast, swing with intent and and kind of develop those like pathways and, and that coordination. And then eventually as they get a little older, like, okay, let's start tightening things up and, and you know, focusing more on the bat to ball swing decision. Type sure. Yeah, and it's funny because like I remember when, uh, you know, Dr. Greg Rose with uh, TPI put out, it was like building speed in young golfers or something like that. And this is, again, probably like, or five years ago yeah. um and i remember when that when that hit like the early uh early baseball twitter mm-hmm. you know like when it was still yeah still a little bit more a of a place it's it's still wild yeah. uh i remember you know the 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 pushback uh, the pushback against that is the same as it is now which is like well you have to make contact yeah. right and it's like yeah i get that but like if you are making good contact at low bat speed that that is only successful for a very short amount of yeah. time and it's during that period of time when there is a kid who is, is still in their own individual like non-linear development of themselves as an athlete as a baseball player as a person that's the only window of time when that's going to be successful and yeah. that door is going to close really quick because there's this natural stratification that occurs where mm-hmm. just like Kids can run out of the game. The good kids stay. A lot of the kids that are still developing athletes, like they get, you know, they just get carved. Yeah. And like you're just, the runway for that is like, it's not infinite. Yeah. It just isn't. Yeah. And it's funny because like I was reading, I was rereading like the athletic skills model book because I'm of the super secret. Yeah. The super secret squirrel project that we're trying to put <laughs> together to, to marry a lot of our uh, youth educational training stuff into one mm-hmm. thing. Uh, and one of the things that they note in that model is like, there's kind of this proven thing that like late bloomers, a lot of times are highly successful if, if they stay in the game, yeah. but it's just like, it's this huge if, you know, like, because they're late bloomers, it means that they went through this period of time where they just had to like scratch and claw to stay competitive. Yeah. And it cultivates this like this resilience, mm-hmm. which in baseball, like we need more than anything because so much of the game is just like, you're constantly failing. Yeah. So there's like, there's benefit to that. But right now in the travel ball ecosystem where most of it revolves around like how competitive can you help my team be right now in this environment? 
those kids just get scrubbed out super early. Yeah. They get scrubbed out before the end of Little League. Mm-hmm. So, like, we're for sure not taking, like, late bloomers at, like, 13 and 14. Yeah. Uh, and, and I just don't know that it makes our game any better to, like, to remove those kids early. Yeah. You know? No, I agree. And it's, it's a tough one for sure. And I always think of it this way. It's like the environment creates the intention of the athlete and the intention will create the action, right? Or the mechanics. Yes. And I think about youth baseball. When I watch games, it's like you have the perfect storm of humongous strike zones, right? <laughs> Truly. Small people, small arms, small bat, right? Um, coaching that is very focused on you know not striking out and yep. plus the the it sucks to strike out it just 100%. does and like when you're 11 especially like whether you're 11 or you're a big leaguer like it's embarrassing to strike out and walk yep. back to the dugout um so that just all forces these athletes to optimize for contact right it's like okay i'm not gonna strike out i'm not gonna uh try and do too much you know there's cultural yep. sort of like um like uh influence as well don't be selfish don't be selfish like i used to get shamed for for flying hitting fly balls like sure. when i was growing up because like yeah. like i said if i hit a ground ball i was safe mm-hmm. so if i swung too hard it's like i'm getting absolutely just like beat down like what are you doing bad teammate come on like you're making it about you whatever yeah. like um and it didn't help me ultimately when i got to college and had aspirations of playing pro ball but um anyway yeah that environment it's just by design, it's it's gonna force kids to throttle their swing, mm-hmm. to 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 just kind of like widen out, like not swing with any intent, and and optimize for contact. And the same could be said about pitching, right? It's like a hundred percent. Like they're just out there trying to throw strikes. And uh, obviously, there's a precision aspect to our sport, but mm-hmm. when you talk about developing skills at scale, like you talk about all the time, it's like we're we're probably missing the boat a little bit and not lo- allowing kids, especially the, the ones you're talking about, to really um, develop skills that matter that are gonna give them. Success, like, later on. And, and it's so, you know, it's so wild to me that, like, uh, because, again, we're talking about a, a stage of baseball where the overwhelming majority of parents are not professional coaches. Yeah. They're parents who coach. Um, that that as a parent, and, and I was I was guilty of this, and I was guilty of this both before Danny started at Driveline, and I started, like, having my eyes opened, and even probably for, like, another 18 months afterward, because I just, like it's hard to work out of like that dogma that you're just kind of conditioned to accept, right? You just, but we, I have a child nine to 14 and that kid is a kid in a biological sense when they like maneuver around my house. Yeah. I went into my bathroom the other day, bath towel hanging on the wall. There's a bunch of toothpaste on it. Danny is sharing this bathroom. And I'm like, D, why is there toothpaste on the <laughs> on the bath towel, man? Like, how how did how did this happen? And he's like, I don't know. And he's not he's not being intentionally duplicitous, right? Yeah. He's just like, I don't know, man. Like yeah. I came in here, I brushed my teeth, wiped my hands, and I left, and somehow there's just toothpaste everywhere. Yeah, it happens. Point being that like these kids are just like biologically very different than yeah. teenagers and adults. And we understand this in basically every facet of life other than between when we get on a diamond. Yeah. And then we get on a diamond, it's like, and I don't know if it's parents who feel shame when their child strikes out or parents who uh, who have good intentions that they want to see their child succeed and they don't want to see their child publicly fail. Yeah. But it's just like the, the total sum of the ecosystem is like, don't fail. Yeah. Don't fail, don't fail, don't fail. And it's like, okay, first of all, nobody gives a shit about winning and losing these games. Other than us yeah. parents, right? And we don't kids care too. Yeah, yeah, they they care, but they, they care, care, we care. Yeah, right. They care with like this incredibly limited uh, emotional attachment to the outcome. You know, it's like it's high highs and low lows in the aftermath directly thereafter, and then you go get like uh, a McFlurry, a McDonald's, and we're fine. Yeah, you know, like we're absolutely fine. But like the whole thing pushes us to ignore what we can see with our own two eyes about how good these kids actually can be about coordination tasks. Yeah. And specifically coordination tasks that have to be paired to perception. Yeah. We're just like, yeah, like my same kid who's just going to like fall down the stairs apropos of nothing or run into a wall or get toothpaste over a, all over a bath yeah. towel is also going to be just like exceptionally coordinated in this in this competition environment. Yeah. It's just it's it's completely out of step with biology. Totally. But we talk ourselves into it all the time. All the time. Um, 
So, so in terms of like systems and we've talked, Jeremy and I've talked a lot uh, about like building a system for Academy uh, because we, I think started with this thing, basically going like vanilla driveline and we've iterated over the course of now, you know, moving two seasons, moving into year three, we're in a better position than we've ever been in. Um, But taking kind of like the, the system that you had in Menlo and then having the opportunity to start to start to deploy it at driveline, like how did you go through that process of going like, this is going to be the number one thing. Yeah. Like in this, and these are the drills are going to cultivate on that. Like how, how did that even work? Cause yeah. you started with just zero, right? Zero. Yeah. I mean, I remember getting hired and Kyle telling me, I think you're a good hitting coach. The results are there um, over the last couple of years, but we're going to find out, you know, here's a company card Yeah. and we have analysts, you know, like, like looking at everything and, and we'll, we'll find out if you're getting players better. And um, if not, then we'll just stick to pitching. Right. Like, go get them, right? Yeah. So for me, I was like, okay, here's the level of accountability I've never actually had to deal with as a coach. And it was a little scary, but also exciting at the same time. Yeah. Um, so how to start, it was like, what does a good hitter look like, right? Um, and if you ask coaches, you'll get a lot of different answers on, on what, that, what that is, right? And I know it's up for debate, but there's things that we can measure nowadays, right? And sure. at the time, I and this is what I did at Menlo too, was like, okay, let's dig through and see, like, what are they doing? Okay, they're hitting the ball harder. They're hitting the ball more consistently. They're hitting at good angles, swinging at good pitches. Um, so how do we train those things, right? Let's start with what the, the goal is and um, build an assessment, right? To see, okay, where are you in relation to where you want to go? And then the third piece is obviously like build that roadmap, yeah. right? Um, and in this process, we learned like no surprise that the overwhelming majority of, of hitters like didn't even come close to swinging fast enough. Yeah. Um, so bat speed was really kind of where we started. And, and then also looking at just general swing mechanics, which different discussion probably. But um, as far as being data driven, which is kind of obviously like the, the mission statement of the company. Yeah. The bat speed piece was easy because we had tools to measure that. We had to hit yeah. tracks. Um, we knew how hard big leaders hit the baseball. Yeah. Um, yeah. Statcast at that point had been out for six years yeah something, something like, that. like that yeah yeah something like that and um and yeah so so guys would come in and i was and, and i modeled a lot of this off the pitching floor too right sure which was like okay how, how do they train how do they think about skill development and um they had the weighted implements which mm-hmm. i'd already been doing at, at menlo so that was the easiest thing to just copy paste yeah um and that was something that i'd learned in college, I studied kinesiology and I, I was starting to learn about overload, underload training in other sports. Um, and then Dan Hefner is someone that I've always looked yeah. up to. Like he kind of turned me on to doing it in baseball and he had been doing it at Dallas Baptist and they've been raking forever. Um, so at Menlo, I, I kind of like, you know, Jimmy Riggs, some some cheap versions of it. Like we had some youth bats, some softball bats, as underloads, fungos, overload. Did they dent constantly? All the time. Yeah, yeah all the time. Um, remember the first time I tried to grab like a youth bat and use it as like a as like a fungo I think one of our kids Liz is back in like the four three days in like yeah. 2019 took like two swings it's just like the thing turned into like a cricket bat yeah. it's just like pulled. <laughs> it was like all right well this is not the ideal long bat uh, I, uh implement for youth this yeah. is not gonna work yeah we we went to uh went through so many bats and um I was a regular at played against sports oh yeah but um overload we we did just like tape and pennies mm-hmm. and just put it over the bat and um just kind of did like a lot of the same programming we did that we do now honestly i mean it's tinkered a little bit but um did that at menlo so when i came to the drive line it's like all right let's just let's do this and and then what we did also which i think is why danny ultimately came to drive, the drive line could be could be wrong about that but we had to do our own study right so i, I yeah. told kyle like hey this uh overload underload training is is supported by a lot of peer-reviewed research I've used it. I know it works. And he's like, okay, I, I think you're right, but we're not going to push it and we're not going to sell it and make products unless we can prove it. Sure. In-house so replicate these studies and, and see if it works. So, um, we did, we, we got a bunch of volunteers to come in and, and including our athletes in gym. And we did a controlled study, uh, of, of weighted bat training versus, um, guys taking the same amount of swings with just their game bat. Yeah. Same amount of feedback, um, and, and drill design, number of reps, everything the same. And that group that was using the weighted bats got better. Their, their bats be one higher, um, which was great. <laughs> right. So uh, that and, was, yeah, go ahead. It correlates to basically every other study to one degree or another that like overload training uh, implements on the hitting side is just going to be beneficial. And yeah. it's like, if you look at some of them, some of them, it's like, it's, it's preposterously overloaded. Like yeah. 
Like some of those studies, it's like yeah, it's like an eighty ounce battery. Yeah, yeah, 56 but like, ounce. but still, but still got better. Yeah. You know, like still got better. Like it just the stuff just works. It's just preposterous that like anyone pushes back on that. Yeah, yeah, totally. So um, at the time, the only tech we really had was a, was a hit tracks and video. So we um, built the the bat speed sort of like model based on okay, like let's let's look at your battle ball data. Um, and then we're also looking at things like bat path with video. Yeah. And ultimately, we we're able to use the data from hit tracks to create a bat ball report. Um, that was like version two of our assessment. Sure. And we started to look at things like where do you make the most contact? Where, where do you swing and miss? Um, what do your bat ball? What 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 do you look like? Pull middle oppo, mm -hmm. for instance, at different angles. Where are you hitting balls the hardest? And we started to kind of get like a a better idea of the outcomes, right? And then working off that, we can start to look at the swing. So like, for instance, you can't hit the high pitch. Like we have, we've done our assessment, it's 200 swings, whatever. On the high pitch, you, your average launch angle is 60, swing and miss a ton. Um, you have to, like whatever expected batting average. Right. Um, now let's take a step back and look at the swing. Look at the bat path, what's causing that? And, and then kind of like working that way. Um, so, so it transitioned into just kind of looking at, all right, bat speed, how hard you hit the ball. And then we went a little deeper into, okay, let's understand use a hitter kind of more holistically and, and, um, and start to like patch holes that way. Yeah. And like the, the fundamental intention and then outcome of that initial assessment is something that, that nowadays I think it's so easy to implement because the tech, like the, the barrier of entry is just so low, Yeah, you know, like, like I, I think the overwhelming majority of the stuff for hitting, you just get a you just get a sensor. You just get a sensor because it's gonna tell you speed and attack angle. Yeah. And you can kind of work backwards just having those two things. And you know, we we just again the podcast that's dropping today is kind of like this idea of like the lesson model. Yeah. And the lesson model where you're kind of constantly in this like negative feedback loop where like because you're giving me seventy five dollars an hour, I'm incentivized to like identify problems. Yeah. Well, you do this wrong, you do this wrong, you do this wrong. And when all that stuff exists on a plane where there's just no information about like how hard do you hit the ball, how fast do you move the bat, yeah. and like and how is attack angle uh coloring both of those things. Yeah. Right? Like it's just it's really it, it's a it's a terrible environment for building hitters because it lacks all context other than like my stupid eyeballs. Yeah. You know? Totally. Yeah. And I think that um as I rolled it out, I was a little concerned because it's it, it's so different than what most yeah. people are used to. And um, so many haters, like as I got the job, you know, I kind of had built up a little bit of a following on social mm -hmm. media and a lot of hitters had kind of been DMing me questions and stuff like that. And they asked like, hey, can I come in and get a lesson? You know, can I come in and hit with you for a day? And I just like don't believe that that works. Right. I'm sorry. Like I, there's some great hitting coaches out there that offer really good um, instruction. Don't get me wrong. But developing hitters is an incremental progress that takes time period and i'm sorry like and i do this sometimes work with guys and, and give them you know some feedback on their swing or whatever but it's always met with like there's no overnight fix yeah right like this kid in a ball comes to me and he wants to be the big leaguer and it's like there's nothing i can tell you in a 30 minute hitting session that's gonna like snap you're yeah. in the big leagues now like the truth is it's hard to develop skills it takes a lot of deliberate work a lot of reps a lot of really really focused um intentional deep practice and it takes time and that's why with driveline it was like we're not doing lessons if you want yeah. to train here you have to train here yeah and it's going to take time and it's going to take a lot of reps and you're going to get in the weight room and you're going to do all these other things that that we know work yeah and um yeah I, i'm not sure anyone else is doing it that way at the time you know when it came to hitting at least and yeah it maybe cost us some money because a lot of people wanted to fly in for a day and fly out and, yeah. and give us 100 bucks or whatever but I just didn't feel confident in my heart like that was the best way to train hitters. And yeah, um, yeah it, it's worked out so far. Well, and, it, and it's funny because like for us, the whole reason we have teams is to is to basically get as much time as possible getting kids good. Yeah. Right. And like because that was because that was the thing, you know. Uh, yeah. Danny was here for six weeks. But to me, it was just like, all right, well, how, how do I extend this amount of stimulus over time and yeah. keep it that consistent? Because that's the only way that it's going to be pervasive and sticky yeah like coaching would be so easy if the job was just like say the most magic words yeah it'd be great yeah it'd be great i just walk up to the cage and be like some word salad immediate like you know 
performance benefit, but like most of the time in that environment, you don't even have the chance to like quantify that stuff to begin with. Yeah. That feel better? Yeah. Good. And now I walk away. Exactly. And then like two swings later, you just revert to the same bullshit pattern that you had before. Yeah. And it all goes away. Yeah. I have to give Comstock some credit too, because when I first started coaching, it was at Menlo and, and he was the best player on the team. And um, he was the hardest worker on the team also, as is often the case, right? This is my not surprised face. Yeah. And this guy, like he killed me, dude. I mean, he was in the cage every day, 7 a.m. And I'm not a morning person <laughs> working. And like he outworked anyone else on that team, like including you. 5X. Yeah, yeah, literally. I mean, he would like show up. Not, I lived on campus, but like knock on the door with like a, a Starbucks and yeah, and uh, I was making no money. So he'd buy me a um, sandwich sometime. Sure. He was like the ultimate dude. He still is. But um, he still is. Anyway. I saw him and, and Dan, like, like I love Dan. Don't take this personally, Dan, but he's not, I wouldn't say he's like a natural athlete. He's not like sure someone that I think could just like jump into another sport and go be like a professional at it. The skills that he developed were, were developed through work, hard work, right. And not natural talent. Like his natural gift is work ethic. And right. this is a guy that like became a really good catcher, became a really good hitter. Yep. Um, through just outworking everyone. And um, as I've gotten professional baseball and even being with driveline, it's like people don't realize how much these guys practice and how much they train and how much yeah. they hit, right? Like Charlie Manning always tell, told me, hitters hit, you gotta hit a lot. Um, and I think there's a false like idea out there in, in hitting where it's like, you can go to a lesson a couple times a week, take your swings, take your video, work on your like mechanics and then just be good. And yeah. the truth is, like most people, are, most people are doing it kind of in the shadows or whatever. But these guys are working, and and they're taking hundreds of swings a day, over and over and over, and just putting in so much work. And that's why I drive on was like, look, if you want to train here, like we're gonna do it the right way, and yeah. it's it's gonna require you to be here a lot, and and we're gonna be putting in tons of of reps and just absolutely getting after it because that's how you actually get better at something. And you might not want to hear it, but you're going to have to work really, really hard if you want to reach your goals. And I think that's, you know, resonated with a lot of players. And sometimes guys like don't like it, like, but, and they, and I'm, I'm fine with that. You know, oh, I don't know. I was only kind of hoping to get some, some pointers. And, and it's like, then don't train here. Right. I don't, I don't want you to train here. I don't want um, our name to be associated with you. If you don't want to work hard for, for your goal, then you obviously don't want it that bad. And um, it's a harsh reality, but it, it is what it is. And it, well, and I think the funny thing is, is like so much of what we push for with Academy is, is to create more Dan Comp socks. Yeah. You know, like that, that I think is just the core, the core intention and the, the core attempt to like revolutionize the environment of youth baseball is to harness a very specific window of opportunity when kids are imminently adaptable to stimulus. So all we need to do is just provide them stimulus that is like uh, skill positive and it's engaging. Yeah. That's it. Because if you, if you show them that they're getting better, and you engage them in this activity of like ringing the PR bell. Yeah. You know, like I just want to create someone that's like addicted to that process. Yeah. And 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 again, I will give uh I'll give Dan more props. To me, when I look at him and how much of a dog he is on the floor in his current capacity working at driveline, he works his ass off. That's not that's not a that's not a thing he just deploys in one aspect yeah, of his life. It's how it's wired. It's pervasive. Yeah. Like that's, and you know, and you can, uh, you can chicken and egg that whole thing, right? Because like obviously Dan showed up to you in a fashion where he obviously was like patterned for that. Yeah. Uh, I, I just, I am firmly of the belief that like you can create people that have that attachment to like this Casey Weathers 101 tattoo pending hard work gives you honesty. Yeah. You know, like that's just a thing that you can help people get towards and if it resolves to like get them truth about how good they were on a baseball field and you get the most out of you like your experience in the game great now go apply that and be an accountant yeah like that's just a thing that we can do and, and again the, the thing i keep coming back to is just like it's so impossible to get to the bigs like it's just, yeah the no like and we all like talk about this and i think we all kind of tacitly understand it but as, as parents your experience as a parent is like just defined by the relationship you have to your children. And I think in the back of your mind, it's like, well, maybe my kid can be that one. Yeah. You know, like that's what we want. I, I remember I had a friend of mine. Um, and I think this was either right before, or right after we first started coming to driveline. And I had posted some video of, of D hitting. And he was like, Hey, you should take him to such and such guy. 
It's like, why? Well, he's got a really good eye for these things. Yeah. Like, man, okay, but my kid is nine. You know, like, what what information, what are you going to see with a nine-year-old that's going to be like, oh, no, we're just going to future-proof the whole thing. Yeah. But uh, but I also understand it just in the in the framework of like you you leverage someone else's experience that's been around this for longer. Sure. So it's it's not it's not bad, but it also just like it's so completely divorced from what you can see with open eyes about what good hitters do. Yeah. They are very good at moving fast, and they're very good about making good decisions more often than not yeah. relative to like normal people yeah. right and that stuff gets exposed to different levels as the competition level increases but yeah. like you know i mean if you think about i don't know who's the who's the worst like swing decision guy in the show bias probably. bias yeah. yeah probably hobby right yeah. what does hobby look like in like a men's league game the greatest yeah. player ever Right, because the competition level is going to stress the thing that he is probably weakest at, yeah. and it's going to allow him to deploy the thing that he is best at, which is just like preposterous bat speed. Yeah, just well, I mean, I guess it's probably down a little bit. Yeah, it used to be, was. used yeah. to be, right? So uh, it, it's just, man, it's just such a weird environment where, uh, you know, we just, I think, in youth baseball, we just kind of like fundamentally uh, disregard the effect of a stopwatch. Yeah. Like that concept. Like I just, I don't want to do that. I just want to see my kid. I want to be told by someone that I trust more than myself that like, it's going to be okay. Yeah. Your first year in pro ball as a, with the Phillies, 2019? 19. 20, okay. So four seasons. Yep. Uh, has there been, I guess when you started, yeah. uh, was this bat speed concept like extremely new to like, all of the athletes that you worked with and like over time has it the new kids the maybe high school kids or kids out of college that have been drafted like they already kind of know some of these concepts like yeah. do you feel like it's a little bit more per pervasive than it was oh, four years totally, ago dude oh it's changed so much i mean so much like when i first came on no one was really doing bat speed some organizations were some of them had actually worked with driveline and myself and, and kind of rolling that out but um it was new new to a lot of people um new to the players and not only bat speed, but like the importance of it, you know, guys like didn't know their bat speed, didn't know how hard to hit the ball. And like, that was part of like first year was like, okay, doing an assessment and showing these players with brutal honesty where they are and how they stack up against big leaguers. And so many of them are like, Oh man, I thought I had, I thought I hit the ball hard. You know, I hit like 14 homers in, in college or whatever. It's like, <laughs> yeah, like you're a good hitter. Don't get me wrong. But, you know, if you were in the big leagues today, you'd be in the second percentile of bat speed. Yikes. And um, I think data like allows you to have those those tough conversations sometimes because um, you can be like realistic about them, about where they are, you know. And um, I think coaches often avoid those conversations because they don't want to hurt feelings or whatever but i think that's one like one of many benefits to being data driven is like hey man here it is like this is where we're at I'm, i really care about you and i want you to be a big leader so like let's let's start getting towards what a big leader looks like but um anyway that was definitely met with um a lot of shock and it's different like you watch bats be training guys are they're swinging you know like really hard and and they're like they're, they're hitting with a radar gun or a hit tracks or a, a, a bat sensor or whatever and a lot of the coaches are like what are we, what's going on here? You know, like, right. why are they doing that? Like they're ruining their swing, this and that. It's like, no, <laughs> like it's literally a small percentage of their training, first of all. And second of all, like there's a why behind it and it works. And ultimately like we saw results in the field and um, got some buy-in, but it was definitely new and the players loved it, you know, like especially the ones that needed it and the ones that saw results. Um, and as I got into like year two and three and those players that, that did it started to have success at a high level and like get to the big leagues, when maybe they weren't prospects before or, or whatever that then it was like spread like wildfire where the whole org's like hey i need i need that you know and like yeah. we did a lot of same stuff we do here but like posting leaderboards um in some ways like publicly shaming guys into wanting to get better you know mm -hmm. it's like all right he, he, every day i'd post like here's the batted ball log from the big league game and here's the minor league batted ball log like top 20 batted balls and the big leagues would be like 112 111 109 right. 109 106 and then it's like the minor league one it's like 103, 102, 102, you know, um, just to the point where it's like, it's undeniable, right? It's like, okay, they're obviously hitting the ball harder than I am. But um, the industry has changed a lot. And um, this last draft class was, was so interesting because I always do an introductory sort of presentation and you get to know the guys and whatnot. And 
I remember asking them, you know, hey, like, as a group, who's hit off a machine before? Every single guy raised their hand. That wasn't the case in 19. It was in 2019. It was new for a lot of people. Like the first time we rolled machines out in spring training, like I was the most unpopular guy on the earth. <laughs> it was like <laughs> all the balls are going into the cage. And, and then uh, you were talking about Bohm earlier. Like I'll never forget Bohm in the cage. Like we set it up at like 90 or something and everyone's swing and missing. And then Bohm walks into the cage and swing and miss, like foul ball, foul ball, a little bit more baseball, like pop up to the infield. And then it was just like line drive, line drive, line drive. And then a lot of the hitters were like, Wait a second. None of us can do this, but the first rounder, the first like rounder. the best hitter, yeah. is actually he, he can. So maybe there's something to it, right? But um, anyway, every single guy raised their hand. Who's used the bat sensor? Everyone raised their hand. Who's used uh, a launch monitor, Rapsodo hit tracks, whatever? Every single guy raised their hand. Cave, I mean, you name it, biomechanics, whatever. And um, these guys, like when I met with them one on one, you know, it's like, hey, you know, what what are your goals? What do you need to work on? Well, I swing the bat 69.5 miles an hour. Like I need to get to 72. Like I really like bat speed. We did bat speed training at my college or high school kid would say like, oh, I need to get my, you know, this up or that or whatever. Like it was just changed so much. And um, I think that's a, a large reason why you were seeing so much change in professional baseball about the requirements to be a coach because they're getting pressure from sure. underneath, right? Mm -hmm. Where it's like all these guys are growing up in this environment, going to places like driveline, going to schools that use this stuff to where, um, I would have, if I didn't know how to use those things, like I, I would have been screwed mm -hmm. because all those players were expecting it. And um, it, it's been interesting to see how fast the industry has, has improved and, and changed in the last four years. And I'm, uh, yeah, I'm curious to see how it continue, continues to, to develop as more tools get available and more people get sort of access to this. I'm, I'm, I think the thing I'm curious about is like where those coaches are going to come from, you know, because just like I think. There is all the opportunity in the world for uh, older salty dogs, like guys that have been around this for a while, to like learn. Yeah. You, you, you. If you know how to talk to hitters in the the loop that you need to close, it's just like learn to understand a data driven assessment and interpret that for the individual athlete. You probably already learned like the most significant thing. You yeah. know how to talk to hitters. Yeah. I agree. The the you know the what was it like? Was it? I, there was that one off season where there was just like a bunch of guys that got hired that like had, you know, minimal uh, amounts of pro mm -hmm. experience. And like, it seems like there's been a little but bit maximal of maximal like amounts of help scout tickets. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, help scout being driveline's old uh, customer uh, relations, email software, RIP driveline uh, help scout. It's a good old days. Yeah. The hand of God pitch. Uh, the the velo tree, the yeah. guy that was throw, wanted to know what kind of tree it was good to best to throw his plyos in. But I digress. Yeah. Uh, it, it's just like the the pushback against this stuff from certain segments of coaching is like it's it's only hastening your exit from the game. Yeah. Right. It, and it doesn't have to be that way. Right. It, it doesn't have to be that way. And like there's certain segments of our industry that like say unflattering things about some of the certification drive and yeah. certainly we're we're in that we're in that space right but like look uh who could benefit most from foundations of hitting a guy who has the tools and has the experience but doesn't speak this language and needs to understand this from like a new lens and learn how to apply their experience yeah. through this new lens the path is really clear to be successful there totally. if you push back against it just because you're committed to ignorance well like don't be surprised when you don't have a job yeah no, it's happened. And I think uh, there's a book called The Hard Thing About Hard Things. There's yeah. a quote I love. It's like, you kind of respect people who are willing to, to drive off a cliff without leaving any skid marks, you know? And, uh, <laughs> sure. Um, so in a way, it's like, there's, I, I saw like three different camps of people. The first camp were, were the ones that embraced it, right? And saw it as an opportunity to where, like you're saying, and this is what my boss actually said when I first got hired to the whole group. They go, Jason can teach you guys things that will ensure your career in baseball. Yeah. And not just me, but there are other people involved. We can teach, we're going to teach you everything about analytics, about technology, about uh, motor learning, skill development. And these are things the industry is valuing and going to continue to value. And if you really embrace it and learn, you're going to be set. And the people that really did that and were open-minded and, and already possessed, like you're talking about the soft skills and the experience and all those things. Those guys, like, they're all in the big leagues or they're coordinators yeah. or they're never going to have to worry about 
a job ever again. The second one I, I referenced earlier, the ones that just like dug their heels in and said, no, I'm not doing that. It's not right. I don't believe in it, whatever. And, and they're mostly out of the game, just like big mad on Twitter. Yep. And then um, the second camp is like the ones that were kind of like hiding in plain sight, you know, that just say, learn to say the right things and then behind closed doors, like do their right. own thing. And, and those ones are like slowly getting weeded out. But um, yeah, it's, it's interesting because people see it as a threat when it, it's not that at all you know what i mean and they, they take it personally when someone like myself comes into a coordinator role and i have empathy for that because like the rules have changed a little bit and what yeah. i mean by that is like i remember a conversation i had with a, a baseball lifer a friend of mine and he goes look man i need to understand that he's 50 years old he's like to become a coordinator for the entirety of baseball you have to play you have to coach at a lower level as a hitting coach yep. Um, fourth coach, whatever, like go to the DR coach there, go, go be a manager, lower level, then be a, a bench coach at AAA. And then, then maybe you, you, whatever it's like, he's like, I rode the bus for 30 years before I was able to be a coordinator. Sure. And now here are you 27 years old and you're a coordinator. And, uh, it upsets a lot of people because it, it's just not how it used to work. And like, I, I understand that, but, um, for them to think that all these new tools and like the adaptations that. The game has made has had as far as like what we can measure and, and what we value and things like that like it's not a threat that takes away the skill like you're mentioning of, of actually coaching right. i'd argue the opposite like these tools make your skill even more valuable because it's just informing you and informing your decisions and your actions and um it, it's been interesting to see because those people that have really embraced it like they, they've taken off you yeah. know and, and and they're and they're studs and um I always say this, like you, you asked like the next wave of coaches, like, I think, I hope I'm wrong, but I think like the window of time for people like myself who didn't play professional baseball to like lie through the ranks and become a big league or a, or a, a coordinator for a, sure. a team or whatever organization. Like, I think it might be closing because now it's like the players that are retiring that have experience with this stuff or now yeah. experts in this stuff. They're the ones that are like getting, you know, churned back into the game as coaches and, yeah. and climbing the ranks. Like some of the, quickest movers like guys that i hired were players that like okay he was in triple a last year was like really curious about this stuff learned a lot like just really embraced all the information we had and then it's like boom we hire him yeah and next thing you know they're they're in the big league so they're they're a, a coordinator and that happened like multiple times and it's not just the phillies it's like other orgs as well um so yeah like it, it's it's been an interesting thing to like kind of see and, and be early in it and um kind of kind of for better or worse like watch it kind of change things well and it's it's so to me so much of it just shows uh to a degree why the game at the professional level is kind of where it is right now uh specifically because of just like how far behind a lot of hitting training is behind pitching right like that's it's it's the other side of a related equation and to whatever degree we had a period of time where like you know, guys are like getting drafted hadn't hit on a machine don't have blast don't have any type of launch monitoring technology yeah. like man uh it's just you can't you can't self-select into ignorance and just expect that you're going to get the best possible outcomes anymore yeah. it's just not it ain't going to work that way man. yeah it's just not going to work that way and like you know pitching went through this a while ago right like there were the big you know fires on twitter every time a guy did a pull down yeah no different than Beth. How right? how dare you? It's literally the same thing. How dare you? You don't you can't run up to it in the box. Yeah. You can't run off the bump. And like it's just you, you know, I, I think again, uh, from a youth baseball lens, I think a lot of people in the ecosystem are driven by a, an intention that starts in a relatively positive place. Like they just want the best for their kids. Yeah. Because of the closeness and the proximity to you have to either your child being your athlete or your child's buddies are your athletes. Like that's the that's the player population that you have to coach and then you see somebody doing like a shuffle swing happy gilmore yeah and you're like i don't i don't you know i can't see how there's like one-to-one -one map between this and what the task is in competition and there's just like this massive cognitive different dissonance because those same coaches will just put kids on a tee for a half hour yeah and walk away i, I can't tell you how many practices i've seen on a youth 60 foot field where there's like four tees and four kids and the parents and coaches are just like they're off doing something else yeah and those kids aren't even being 
instructed and driven towards the batted ball outcome they're making on a tee. Yeah. So now you're just entirely dependent on a child to go like, was that was that swing solution one that I should keep? Yeah. Is that one that I want to just try to make some type of attachment to? Yeah. Like that doesn't make any sense. Yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, and like you know, to to whatever degree bat speed training is like, it's the pull down of of hitting. It's yeah. just like, look, man. It, you just have to understand, and this has been well understood in like a crap ton of Olympic sports, that there doesn't need to be like direct one to one correlation between the task and competition and the task and training to it to it maximally benefit your ability to deploy a sequence. Yeah. Your ability to harness power, your ability to engage in stretch shortening cycle. Yeah. Like all that stuff, it still plays. Yes, just because I can't actually do a happy in the box, although I mean that's kind of what slappers do in softball. Yeah. I've seen a kid do a walking wind up off a mountain, so you never know. Yeah. That was tight. That was tight. That's great. Uh, so, yeah, man, it's just, I, I don't know. I think, you know, we're, and it's funny, like in the driveline side of things, it's like, you know, a lot of people do pivot picks now, just just broadly. Like, there are a lot of people yeah. do pivots. You know, there's it's people that still do, yeah. yeah, pivots and, uh, you know, used to be rockers and now it's step backs. And like that stuff is not even just kind of exclusively in our domain, it seems like, because a lot of people have just adopted it. Uh, but then I think about things that we do, like uh, offset rotation. You know, like I, I've seen a lot of other people post clips of kids doing uh, hookums, you know, yeah. some, something like that or something like a Kershaw drill or whatever. Yeah. I don't see that much of like offset rotation stuff where it's like we're really just putting you in this constrained position, much like a pivot pick. Yeah. And we're, we're forcing you to kind of navigate around getting your torso and pelvis and barrel oriented in a direction to still hit the ball hard. Yeah. Like that stuff, weirdly to me, doesn't seem like it's as comfortable. Uh, and, and it's not being adopted that way, which is fine. Yeah. Uh, I get it. Yeah. yeah. You know, like, like I've said uh, on this podcast several times, you guys are all right. I'm wrong. Don't do any of this stuff. It doesn't work. I want to maintain whatever degree we have competitive advantage for as long as possible. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Yeah, no, bat speed's bad. Don't don't do that. Yeah. Um. So where so so given where we are right now, um, I'm curious where where you think like the next big kind of if we know that like bat speed is the most significant low hanging fruit, and I think pairs pairing with that is like you have to be a good athlete to be able to develop maximal bat speed. So you kind of have to address both sides of the sure. equation. Like, you know, there's, you know, there's, there's enough people that I think thankfully are kind of in agreement about some of that stuff. Not, it's certainly not universal, but I'm, I'm curious where you think like the next one tier up lower hanging fruit is because, uh, you know, it seems like we kind of understand uh, bat speed, at least here. Uh, we understand, uh, smash factor application of bat speed right you want to just make yeah. flush contact this is like ted williams one-on-one stuff mm -hmm. um i'm curious though that like if if swing decisions and kind of like leaning more into the perceptual stuff is the next big path that we just don't know about and and the thing that i'm thinking about specifically is like when we were still doing gaze tracking in the facility yeah uh, gaze tracking meaning literally like putting a, a little camera on the eyeball and watching kind of how guys uh, the strategies they used to pick up the ball. And and if I remember from the studies, there's like three or four dominant strategies, which makes the whole thing really tough. Yeah. Like, because there's not just one thing. It's not like bat yeah. speed where you can just go like, all right, there's a one-to-one -one between, if you want to hit the ball harder, you have to move the bat faster because that's just physics. Yeah. If there's four different dominant perceptual strategies for like how to pick up a ball, how on earth do you like figure out which one's ideal and, yeah. and all that perceptual stuff for me is like the the great unknown and i'm not i'm just curious where you are with it yeah no i agree with you and i think we're probably pretty far from knowing the answers there um when it comes to swing decisions i think right now the focus is on more how to train it and approach mm -hmm. and yeah. game planning and like kind of what the intention of the hitter is and different yeah. counts and stuff like that that's probably where i've spent most of my time and how we focus on our our uh swing decision training Will there be advancements in, you know, like research on, on gaze tracking, on uh, application of virtual reality and then other like aspects of, of the actual visual acuity of a hitter? Um, maybe, you know, I, I think it'll be solved by like the U.S. military, not the, the guy at the ABCA, <laughs> but uh, it's a really hard problem to solve. You know, you're talking about uh, 
human vision is it's a really complicated subject and, and it's uh, so and it's so messy you know because just yeah. like uh so much of it is going to be defined by the perceptual strategy of the hitter it's going to be defined by how well the pitcher hides or doesn't hide what they're trying to throw at you like it's just uh, it's it's so it's so tough you know like we i had a meeting with a kid uh i think it was this week um and the dad, we, we were going over like an edge batted ball report and we're just talking like bat speed, bat speed, bat speed. The yeah. kid is, uh, uh, Carson, great job. Uh, kid is like, you know, 80, 85, 86, top eight DV, uh, peaking out around, uh, 89 and a half or something like that. So he's 16 years old. He's going to be hitting balls 90. He's in a really, really good place. Yeah. Um, so we had all this whole conversation about, uh, about bat speed. And then the parent asked me, he was like, well, what do you like? What else? okay well uh what else is just like it's the decision thing he's like okay well what do you got on win reality and i'm like i, I don't know like yeah, have you guys use one and he's like yeah i actually used one this year and and i felt like i was kind of in a slump and i was having a hard time picking up the ball and i just used that system and like he's literally kind of training perception and saw that pay off in the game yeah. and it's like uh you know the my thing with vr has always been if it's not, if it's not really one-to-one, -one, you know, if there's like, if there's slack in that system, then it's just inherently not as effective. But if you solve that problem, then maybe that's a way that you get reps just on the perception side. Yeah. You know, and like, in it's not, it's not going to be the same as, as being in the box on a dirt field and a chalk outline yeah. with a guy on the hill, but like, much like, Happy Gilmore swings, much like the pivot pick off or pull down, yeah. right? It, it's all it's all kind of towards this whole training system of stuff you have to address. Yeah, and man, the the perception thing just thing seems to me like there's there's just like a lot of low hanging, not low hanging fruit. There's a lot of gold in that hill. For I just sure. don't think we have any idea where it is or how to get to yeah. it yet. Yeah, I agree, and I, I think we're a little ways away. I could be wrong, but um, we're we're certainly investigating it. I think a good place to start though is just understanding that the perception action coupling is critical in training right so yeah. like what's the perception and the action in a game right what's the perception look like it's a pitcher going through a motion throwing a pitch at a certain release point and and you can understand like the pitch has particular metrics velocity movements etc yep. um how can we replicate that as much as possible in the game or in practice sorry um because the way it works with hitters is like Every single rep that they see from a pitcher, it's like they swing or they don't swing. They analyze the outcome, whether it's a hit, swing and miss, whatever. They diagnose what happened. If it was a, fail a failure, try again, right? Yeah. It all goes into this mental model. And that's kind of how we think about movement in general, right? And how we learn skills. So to me, it's like we, we eventually we can really understand the perception piece of like what's going on with the eyes and the brain and, and how that turns into movement. But good place to start is like let's just create more reps that are like a game sure that allow the player to to kind of build that model quicker so like they're not having to recalibrate right and i talk about like coaches all the time that i, I talked to that you know played a long time ago they're like yeah i always had to swing like above the ball i always had to think down i had yep. to swing above the ball and it's like well all your practice was 45 mile an hour breaking balls that, or fastballs that just like were dropping a ton because of gravity so like Oh, you, I love this. Yeah, so it's like your perception in training is like to square up a BP fastball. You've had to learn how to like hack your own brain to hit an actual fastball because it's arriving like three inches higher than the mental model that you practiced over and over and over, if that makes sense. So that's Man. why I think machine work is, is so valuable. And even machine work is is subject to some like flaws in, in, in regard to perception action just because sure. like you're not dealing with an arm stroke and the timing of, of hitting um, a pitched ball and um, the spin is always like 100% efficient out of a machine and sure it's not perfect it's better than than you know flips or BP but um, I always say this like the best training a hitter can do is just try and hit off a pitcher trying to get you out and that's why we do so much short box here yeah and, um, it's one of the, the the benefits of coming to driveline as a hitter, I think, that people don't talk about is like there's so many pitchers here that are always throwing, yeah, and they're just getting like more reps and um, and yeah, that's how I think about perceptions. Like let's let's just get more practice reps at a game representative sort of environment and yeah. allow the the player to kind of like you know learn their own sort of model. Yeah, I mean, we talk about that with academy all the time. It's just like you you want to play as many games as possible, but not play games. Yeah, like. You know, like you don't want to pursue this like 120, 130, 160 
uh, game volume for like prepubescent children. Yeah. What you need to do is play games constantly in an environment where you can control some of those variables that come like with real significant uh, and like not negotiable health risks. Yeah. You know, like that's just a thing. It's like we had a guy that was uh, that had a question on uh, Driveline Plus uh, about like a triple header throwing workload um, uh, between uh, and it, so it was through in all three games. Yeah. Yeah, three three a games pitcher? on a Sunday. A pitch. Jeez. Pitched on Saturday, threw in all three games. Throws. Total throw count over the weekend was four hundred and fifty throws. What? How's that even like legal? Shall we shall we go into <laughs> no. uh <laughs> I don't know. I'm having a good day. I don't know. Well, uh, I'm going to be in a room with some of those folks that make those type of rules about tournaments in less than two weeks, and I've got some real significant questions. Uh, because the reality is, is that, like, uh, you know, MLB Pitch Mart, you know, as a recommendation, I don't think it's perfect, but that doesn't mean that it's not an incredibly valuable resource for, like, 95% of use case, because it controls for in-game usage and chronological yeah. usage over time. Um uh, but the point point being is like, uh, I don't I don't really kind of like think that 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 parent or that coach I don't jump down their throats a lot of times just be like, you're a bad person, uh, you're trying to hurt kids, because it's not that simple. Mm -hmm. I I think I think a lot of times again because you're talking about uh, people that are that are largely very much removed from their last competitive play experience. They probably don't work professionally in and around baseball or yeah. have the time to like dive into this thing. Yeah. Uh, and it's just like, well, we just play games because because what else would we do? Mm -hmm. Like the the idea that there's something on the other side of the horizon where you can play games without playing games and you can build rep volume and control for things that are actually like negatively affect health. It's just like it's not a yeah. It's not even real. You know, it's like it's very much a you don't know what you don't know type of scenario. Yeah. Um, now, you know, I, I also will will devil's advocate myself because, uh, you know, there's a kid, I think a 10U kid back in New York that threw like 161 pitches in a CG this summer. Uh, and like, that's just ridiculous. Yeah, it's a lot. Like that that on its face is ridiculous. But like that guy with a 450 throw count, I think the kid threw 90 pitches uh, total, which falls within the MLB pitch mark recommendation for being okay. It's just the fact that we constantly like, don't index for all the other throws that happen aside from when you're on the bump. Yeah. You know, like we just, we act like that stuff doesn't exist. Uh, and then sometimes it gets sideways and somebody gets hurt and yeah. then it's very bad. And it's like, well, how did we end up here? Yeah. And it's like, I, you know, it's, it's hard to tell parents that like they just shouldn't play games of baseball Yeah, because that's the thing that they understand and it resonates with them the most. Yeah. But it's like, look, we just have to have a, a balance. Like, we we ha we can't just be slaves to this industry of just like every weekend tournament because it's just gonna go sideways. Yeah, it's gonna go sideways. And beyond that, uh, it also, you know, from our perspective, you just you can't really pursue skill acquisition and skill development if you're constantly burning those type of calories in game every single weekend. Yeah, you're just you're burning the candle at both ends. Yeah, I agree. And I think baseball is unique in that, like for hitting, for instance, you play a game. I think the average in a nine inning game, the average hitter sees 16 pitches, right? <laughs> so at most, you're getting 16 reps. Yeah. Right. And you're probably swinging, uh, I don't know, six or seven times. Yeah. Um, maybe putting two balls in play, three balls in play, whatever. And over the course of like three hours, it's just not a very efficient way to uh, develop skill, right? Yeah. And like, I understand, like, you have to learn how to play baseball. You got to learn the rules of the game and, and how to hit in the game. And like, you got to, there's a time to play, of course. But if we're talking specifically about developing, baseball hitting skills it's like i could get that much work done in 10 minutes in a cage a hundred percent right and i think it's unique to baseball because like when i look at practice in a sport like soccer or, mm -hmm. or basketball or um tennis like the practices are a lot like the game you know but they're getting more touches like a good pra like a good soccer practice where it's like coned off like yeah. four four v four or whatever it's like they're getting a lot of touches they're 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 getting a lot of reps it's like it's not like baseball practice where a hitter is going to take BP maybe and get 25 swings. They're going to um, do some block training with their defense, like some roll some ground balls, maybe do like some first and thirds or, or whatever. And like they're not getting a lot of reps to actually develop skill. And uh, 
that's what you guys are doing. That's what we did uh, with the Phillies at our academy. Is like, dude, let's like create a hotbed for de developing talent and developing skills that matter. And we do that by giving them an opportunity to to get lots of reps, yeah. game like reps with good feedback, with with high failure rate because failure is key to learning and and um and giving them distinct goals on what to achieve at each day in practice and like and make it fun. Yeah. Right? And these guys love it. Like you talk about goal setting and, and leaderboards and these guys, like the best practice to me is when they don't even realize that they're training. Right. It's like they're up there and it's like us three are, are in a cage and, you know, we have goals and there's a competition. It's it's king of the hill or whatever it is like and we're going, we're having fun, we're having a blast. And yeah. it's like the player doesn't even realize that they're training. They're yeah. just having fun. And to yeah. me, that's a beautiful practice. And that's what practice of skill development should be like. It's easier to accomplish in other sports. Or it's just mini games yeah. that are very similar to to the sport itself. Where as baseball, it's generally speaking, practice design is just very inefficient. Yeah, and it's it's uh it is a technical skill like sport. Like I will say, like you do need to teach kids like how to run the bases and uh, pop up priorities and and mm -hmm. fielding bunts and like all these first and thirds like rundowns like these things are really important. But they take up way too much yeah. of practice time. I think at the at the youth level. Um, if we're really talking about developing skills that are going to help them be successful at the high school level and beyond. And yeah. Mark always talks about the ROI, right? On, uh, yep. on, on stuff. And like, we, it's just like a much higher ROI on doing bat speed training and, and throwing velocity training as opposed to bunt defense. Yeah. Like yeah. it's, I mean, it's it should not, do both, but like it shouldn't. You, right. Yeah. And we'll spend, is not it. Yeah. It, that's how we like explain why we spend like uh, maybe an hour a month on bunt defense. Yeah. And we spend eight hours a month on bat speed training because yeah. like the ROI is just massively higher yeah. doing that thing. So we're going to put more time into it and invest no more time into it. No question. Yeah. It's like, you know, the, to a degree, uh, you just, you have to make sacrifices cause you don't have infinite time. Yeah. You know, like something you, you gotta, you gotta, Put your chips on the table relative to like the things that you value but like i think the whole thing for us is just like taking the signal about what's what's good <laughs> like what is good what is important yeah. let's address that and then you know on the edges take care of everything else we need to do and you know i think if we're if we're right then we are going to have an opportunity to keep kids competitive in this game and in kind of beat biology yeah because that to, to me it's like we had dudo on um early in the podcast uh and we were just kind of talking about this idea that like largely um a lot of times just like the biological outliers just win mm -hmm. you know they get more reps they get more opportunities they get better coaching and then consequently they get better and everybody's like oh yeah. but like you you know again the the late blooming 13 or 14 year old or the kid who was stigmatized at 10 and told not, not to move the bat fast and like everything in the middle, we miss these opportunities to develop those kids. And then they just like, they're just marginal on a 90 foot field. Yeah. You know, like the, the play space changes drastically. Weirdly, they don't have the skills and it's just like, Oh, I don't know how we got here. You know, it's like I did the, the live thing on Instagram this morning. Uh, and there was a kid who, uh, a college kid who's, had a video that's popping around on Twitter this week, uh, and he was repping uh, uh, de uh, hex bar deadlifts, four or five for twenty. Like it's that's incredibly, incredibly impressive. And he's looking to find a school. You go to his profile, and there is not one single metric about like bat speed, exit velocity. Yeah, there's nothing. We can tell you're strong, and like, and for and for most kids, and specifically kids like fifteen and under, strength yeah. to me seems like the lowest hanging fruit in addition to kind of bat speed and velocity and yeah. because there's a holistic relationship between those two things, but like you can't, you can't put out an incomplete picture of yourself as an athlete nowadays and be surprised when most coaches don't know what to do with you because you haven't told me enough. Yeah. Well, and I think, you know, going back to what we were talking about with like the, this year's draft class where every single kid raised their hands that they knew their bat speed, uh, that could be a function of, like the industry uh, kind of accepting it a little bit more at lower levels and like just kids knowing more about that information. And it could also be a function of like, those are just uh, the kids that the Phillies were able to, to like find and scout because yeah. they're not going to take a kid who, I don't know what my bat speed is. I've yeah. never trained with a sensor or a launch monitor. I can't tell you these metrics. They're just not going to draft those kids. And then the kids that can provide those metrics are just have a much higher chance of being drafted 
uh, scouted, recruited, things like that. It helps probably, yeah. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. All right. We should wrap this thing up. All right. We got our work to do. Uh, thank you guys for joining us. As per usual, big notification is the podcast is now on Spotify, both audio and video. We're moving cool. into the big times. And when I can figure out how to decouple uh, my driveline email from like a bunch of other backend stuff that I set up when I was still the manager of CR at driveline, we'll get it on the Apple podcast as well. Um, we got high intent throwing coming up in like a couple weeks in the Academy. So, uh, That's be cool. on the lookout for us posting pull downs and people yelling at us publicly because <laughs> sure, why not? Um, yeah, get that block button ready. Yeah. I get the block button ready. My list is, is, Close to 800 now? Holy cow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's some good numbers right there. Yeah, yeah. I'm just like aggressively like, man, I don't have time for it. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, shout out to the guys who I blocked and now have burner accounts and watch stuff like this. If you want to <laughs> see what I'm going to say, yeah. you're appreciated. Yeah. Uh, that's all I got. Thank you guys for joining us. As per usual, we'll be back in a couple weeks and we'll talk about something else, either good or inflammatory. Thanks, guys. Later. Thanks.